Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. Polygamy skeptics love to claim that a group out of Maine known as the Cochranites introduced several LDS apostles to polygamy or spiritual wifery. Does that evidence hold up or is it cherry picked? We'll talk more about this with attorney Mark Tensmeyer, who will tell us more about the Cochranites, and we'll also talk a little bit about Denver Snuffer's take on polygamy. Check out our conversation. And so what they say is that they come up with this new narrative that whom the 12 were rogue. Pretty much from the beginning. And so they, they're the ones. So around here is where, uh, as far as as far as far I've been able to tell, and I, I'd be interested in seeing documentation and maybe shows it's been talking about otherwise, this is when they say, well, the, um, the quorum of the 12, they get they've encountered and they're influenced by the doctrine of the Conquerites during their missionary travels in the early 1830s, in the early mid 1830s in Maine, another group of people that practice a spiritual wifery. Um, yeah, the Conquerites, I'm glad we're talking about that because that is a big uh, issue. Yeah, yeah, it um, is. And I think that's an interesting thing. And I would really like to explore, have someone explore. And I think that after I'm done with this, I might be a, um, you know, done working on this paper and done that. I think I, I'm, that's something I really would like to look into. Um, so, I mean, that, that's the idea is that the Conquerism is the, uh, that there's a special connection. Uh, um, I don't know quite that there is. Uh, I mean, so what it is, the first contact with them, it's in 1832. It's Orson Hyde and Samuel Smith. Uh, they go to Maine and they, they talk to a lot of Conquerites. They stay with that. They stay with, because of course, as traveling elders, they would stay with people and do work for them. They would preach in churches, and they they went to the Conquerite churches. Um, there's a there's a, a prayer preaching meeting that they have in Boston before they get there, where there's a Conquerite. There's people, a couple of people that are making a big fuss about or make a big scene about Conquerism, and they and um, so they so they encounter it there. Um, but they um, but but their journals, I've read them. They they just they hate, they think it's awful. Um, um, people question, why are you preaching to these people? And uh, Orson Hyde writes in his journal, he says, well, it's because we're supposed to preach the gospel to everybody. And if they repent, they can repent and gather. So and, when did the Cochranites start? Do we know that? Oh, the Cochranites. Yeah, I'll give some background. So the Cochranites, uh, well, the, the, the proper name is the, uh, is the fellowship, is the, uh, it's the society. I'm going to get it right. The Society of Free Brethren. It started by a man named Jacob Conkren, and it's uh, it's 1816 in Saco, Maine, around that area in York County, Maine. And um, one of the things they preach is 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 a spirit. They call it having spiritual wives. Actually, figuring out what their doctrine is is pretty hard because the um, the only real contemporary evidence we have there's a pamphlet that was produced by a man named Ephraim Snitchfield, who. Uh, and it's, and it really pr produced the Conquenites as being just, um, you know, having all kinds of weird ceremonies they do. He says, you know, they, they reenact the Garden of Eden naked. You know, um, he says, you know, Jacob Conquen takes his turn. He, he just calls a woman a spiritual wife and takes her to bed and all of that stuff. And so there's a lot of that kind of thing. Is it kind of a free love movement or? Uh, that's, how he, that's how he depicts it. So there's no marriage at all? Uh, it, it, again, it's hard to say because I mean, reading that is like, is like, well, can you imagine if all we knew about Mormonism is what we read in E.B. How's Mormonism Unveiled? <laughs> can you imagine that? Yeah. I mean, you get some ideas about stuff, but, um, that's pretty much what we're looking at. Um, there was, I, I read it recently. There's a, uh, a, 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 a lady who, well, I'm getting ahead of the story. I'll, I'll, I'll stick it back there. So there's, um, so there's this heyday of Conquenism where they, they, they really do, and they're really into gifts of the spirit. I mean, when you read about like, um, about like the early Kirtland Mormonism and they have these revelations to say, oh, you got to try the spirits, you know, you know, that, that sort of thing, you got to back down from that sort of thing. You, you read about that. That's the type of thing they were doing. There was a lot of that. Well, I just want to throw in here really quick two other groups. Uh, my interview with Dr. Larry Foster, uh, he talked about the Shakers who were completely yeah. celibate, no yeah. marriage, no. Uh, yeah. No sex, no anything. Yeah. He compared those with Mormons, who obviously we know about polygamy. And then um, the third group 
was the Oneida community where marriage was banned and they had, but, but you could have, it's they had very marriage, strict yeah. rules <laughs> about basically you could have sex with anybody according to their rules. And um, yeah, yeah. It was very regulated. Yeah. It was very regulated, but marriage yeah, no, was banned, but sex was, was fine. So a lot, um, a lot of these, so I'm um, curious if the Cochranites were like that Oneida community. Right. And so a lot of these were millinery. So a lot of these, so in a lot of ways, the Cochranites are very similar to like the Latter-day Saint movement. I mean, they're, they're Christian millinarians. They're people that believe that, um, that that you know that basically society's gone to pot because and the and the second coming is going to happen soon that the christian world doesn't get christianity at all mm -hmm. they need to get back to the back to the original teachings they need to and they need to do it in a radical way uh, i mean they, they, they need to get and so that's that's so in a lot of ways you can see how at least especially to an outsider folks they would seem very similar um and so uh, one, one contemporary uh, or one contemporary uh, that gives a bit more sympathetic comment to uh, Jacob Cochran said he was neither trying to destroy churches nor add nor create his own church. He just wanted to bring back the gifts of the spirit and apostolic Christianity to the churches that were already around. And so um, but so it's, it's hard to say, like, what exactly their gods, but spiritual wise is definitely part of it. But um, he gets put on trial for lewdness in, um, in 1819 and Jacob Conkren goes to jail for four years. And during that time, the movement kind of falls apart. A lot of these very charismatic um, movements, they fall apart when their leaders no longer available. Charismatic movements are surrounded around one person. It happens a lot. People thought that was gonna happen to, to Mormonism and it didn't, but, right. <laughs> but yeah. But for a lot of these, especially these smaller groups that, you know, they don't have is then, then that, that's what happens. And, and it did. And so what, what happened is, is that there's a, there's a couple of groups um, that, that still have held congregations up into, through the 18, I don't know, for the next few decades. Jacob Conklin gets out of, out of prison and he just, he doesn't really lead a church anymore. Even the church that still kind of believe his doctrine. Uh, he has a group that he wants to go settle in, in New York and they go. I don't I haven't really heard of what really happened with that. Um, and so uh, that's pretty much it. So the, the, so so the Cochranites only lasted for a decade. Is that what you're they, saying? They, they have there's a their heyday is only about three years long. And then they're around 1816 to 1819. So this pre yeah, they're, they're, I think they're season. around into there, there's um there's remnant groups that are around into the 1840s in the area, but nowhere near to the same size. And OK. Um, and it's interesting. It's one of the things that the uh, that the two elders say a lot is that, that the area is just totally turned off to like gifts of the spirit type things or any of those things that like Mormonism is uh, like revelation. So like speaking in tongues and that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're completely turned off. That. They don't want to have anything to do with that. And so um, anyhow, so that, yeah, so that's that's I mean, that's the Conquerites. And I, I mean, I think that maybe some of those ideas might have influenced what we see in Mormonism. But I, I mean, I think the case is very circumstantial. So, I mean, again, Samuel, Samuel Smith and Orson Hyde only uniformly say that they were absolutely appalled by it. So the idea they, is Samuel Smith and Orson Hyde, is that what he said? Yeah. They're the ones who introduced polygamy. Oh, to well, they, they think that. So the idea is, is that, um, so yeah, so they baptized, I think, like six or seven people. I don't, I don't know if we can um, really definitively say any of those people were Conquernites. In Maine? Yeah, but, um, but it's um, with Throughout, really, um, it's uh, the person that really does a lot of the work there. It's, um, oh, what's his name? One of the apostles who, it'll come to me in a minute. Um, it's one of the uh, apostles who, who apostatizes during the 1837 uh, deal in Kirtland. McClellan, Marsh. It's, no, it's not Patton, Marsh. It's not no. one of the Johnson brothers. Um, it'll come to me in a minute it'll come to me in a minute so he's the one that does he's the one that does most of the baptize he baptizes like a lot of the people there and i've read I, he we don't have his journal because he leaves the church but uh we do have his companion's journal and i've looked through it he never mentions the compromise um <laughs> he, he never does and, and i think part of that was because they were doing a lot of their work in seiko whereas a lot of the um remnant groups were actually in some of the surrounding villages and um, so anyhow, so they get a congregation, they get a branch of about 60 people, which is a good sized branch. 
And um, so they're around. And so the uh, the argument and uh, the 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 majority of the Quorum of the Twelve go to a conference there in 1835. And so the idea is, is that um, they think that there's this uh, there's these uh, there's these um, there's influence there um, that somehow the, the apostles picked it up. I think the case is pretty circumstantial. Uh, I mean, they they uh, they one of the arguments is, is that there's a lot of similarity in terminology, like spiritual lives and things like that. And to the extent that that's true, I, I don't think that that speaks to an influence directly to or to the Quorum of the Twelve specifically, because uh, I mean Joseph Smith had plenty of exposure to this too. Um, his brother-in-law, Arthur Milliken, was born and raised there at Saco Maine. So he has he actually has two members of his fam of his two siblings that marry people from that area. Hmm. The other one is his is uh, Don Carlos's wife, uh, Agnes Colbreth. She's from that area too. And it's and she gets baptized by um, by Orson Hyde and Samuel Smith on that mission. Hmm. And, and she's living in Boston. Her parents still live in the area. And they visit her parents while they're up there. And so, I mean, so there's this. I mean, there's a lot of these. There's lots of places he could have been influenced by that. I mean, um, so Joseph. Well, that's funny because that timeline is roughly Fanny Alger. Um, it, it's a it's a bit before. Yeah, I guess I guess roughly. Um, so so maybe so maybe it does. Um, it's interesting. His his uh uh so Lucy so his sister Lucy and her husband Arthur Milliken they actually go back to Seiko in the Navutz period. Their son Don Carlos Smith Milliken was born there. So, I mean, there's there's a lot of connections there. I mean, and of course Joseph's brother Samuel was in that mission too. So, so he has a lot of people in his family that know about this and, and so hmm. too. So, I mean. If you're, my point is, is if you're going to argue based on circumstantial evidence, it's pretty then, weak. Then, then I mean, you can look at circumstantial evidence and connections in a lot of other places too. Another one that um, Richard Pamela Price may, said was that uh, there's Augusta Cobb, who's uh, Brigham Young's second poor wife. She's um, she gets baptized by uh, Samuel and and Orson in that mission in Boston before they go to Seiko. But it's uh, it's a day or two after that they uh, they baptized her that there's that incident in Boston where there's those uh, Concronite people espousing Concronite doctrine in a in a meeting that they had, and so they say, well, that means that she was a person that was well acquainted with Concronism. Um, yeah, I, I really don't see that that really being a connection. I mean, again, uh, Agnes Colbreth is is also in that same group that gets baptized, and she's actually from that area. And she actually becomes a poor wife of Joseph Smith. So if you're going to argue um, circumstantial evidence and exposure leads to this and that, then I think that's a much stronger connection than anything. Joseph. So yeah, 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 like, to, 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 yeah, to my, yeah. So 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 when it comes to the confidence, I, I don't. That's something I don't particularly find compelling. Um, there's another thing they say as well. The, the apostles did foot washing in England. I mean, you even have William Clayton who never had been there, so they must have picked up that. And foot washing is something Concordites did. Um, foot washing is a very common Christian practice. Right. There's a lot of people <laughs> who do it. It's in the Bible. I mean, yeah. So I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't think the the uh, the Concordites really even need to play play. But they really needed the Concordites to learn about anybody. Really needed it to learn about polygamy or anything like that. I mean. It's in the Bible. It's there's a lot of other groups. Um, as a, I mean, the term spiritual life had been was widely used at the time. It wasn't something that they were had an exclusive thing on. So, yeah, that's something I really don't think there's a lot of merit to. Um, so, but I mean, I would be interested in having to explain that a little bit more. I mean, there's there's like um, there were there were a lot of converts to it, but I I looked I, I sat down and I actually looked to see what kind of what converts from Concordism came into the church and actually gathered, and what I found is that there's a lot of RLDS members that came from that came from that area. I don't know if they were Concordites. There's a lot. Uh, Josiah Butterfield, who was in the High Council in Kirtland, he's one. He's from that area. Um, there's a, quite a few of the Millican families. There's some, there's Millicans that are distant relatives to Arthur, or their cousins or something that stayed in Kirtland. And then affiliated with the RLDS Church, 
<laughs> so there's actually quite a few. So that would be of, some strikes against it, right? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and the biggest thing I think, too, is I really haven't found any sources about anybody who actually knew the Queen of the Twelve, who actually knew the, the Conqueror Knights, who made that connection. Mm-hmm. It's not really until the night. It's well, I think it's it's towards the late 1800s that people start connecting, making the argument, oh, there's a connection. And when they make the argument, they connect um, they connect Joseph Smith. They connect it to Joseph Smith. Not they're not saying it's the form of the twelve. That's a rogue unit. And so anyhow, so that's that's about basically the prices use that argument. They say they they say that um, they start um, experimenting with polygamy in England, and then when they come back to Nauvoo, they're doing it behind Joseph's back. After he dies, then they, you know, when they when they assume control of the church, that's when um, that's when they put polygamy in the base. So they're not saying what Joseph Smith the third said that it happened after. It's not the traditional RLDS position. It's, this is a new position, mm-hmm. and so uh, and that really becomes the basis for a lot of the arguments. Now that's that's the narrative that you hear most commonly today, mm-hmm. and uh, so Denver Denver snuffer. Um, so with the rise of the remnant movement, Denver Snuffer, and a lot of the, um, I use the term neo-primitivist, people that are, um, that, that, that come, I don't know if that's going to catch on, I don't know if they like that term. I've also heard the term neo-fundamentalist, uh, it's, you know, people like Denver Snuffer that have, uh, that come from an LDS, Utah-based LDS background, I use the term LDS here in um, contrast and comparing, opposed to other restoration churches because we are talking about other restoration churches um that have become disillusioned with the current day church they believe um and and the utah era church as well they believe that we ought to get back to uh you know, what they see as the pure form of uh mormonism taught by joseph smith and part of that involves um you know um you know getting taking polygamy out of the picture right and so and that group's a little there's they're a little bit different now now i've never heard uh, from whatever I've read from Denver Snuffer, I've never heard him refer to the Conquerites or really say that the Quorum of the Twelve was rogue. Yeah, I don't. Neither. I don't know that. I don't know that he has. He didn't say that in your interview. With him. And, no. and, and and the papers and things from him, I haven't heard him say that. But there are a lot of people associated with the remnant that do. And well, I mean, the, Denver does say that he. I mean, he puts it all on Brigham, nothing on Joseph. Well, and Denver Snuffer says something that's interesting, different. And so, so Joseph Smith the third kind of played with this idea. He later said, "No, this isn't what happened. I don't think this is what happened now." But the idea that um, that Joseph did do sealings, he did sealings between people. He sealed people from self, but it wasn't polygamy. And so that's kind of what Denver says. That is what Denver says. Um, I don't, I don't know that he's ever really. Um, uh, fleshed out exactly all what that entails, but it, he, I know he in his book, Passing the Heavenly Gift, one of the things that Denver said was um, DNC 132, and he doesn't stand by this anymore, but no, he I doesn't, think it's yeah. part of his evolution of thought is uh, DNC 132 is for revelations and that uh, people conflated polygamy with the sealing power. Right. Um, and so that, that's part of the argument that now, too, and so that that, that that was misinterpreted to be the ceiling power mm-hmm. or that the ceiling power is interpreted to be polygamy. It was corrupted to be that. He says what happens was is that it's well, what he says is it's the law of adoption. You, you have somebody like Joseph Smith who has had, you know, who's, who has the position to hold the keys and you can use various terms for that. He's a person who's had his calling election made sure. He's a dispensation head. There's a lot of different ways you can say that. So you have you get sealed to Joseph Smith and then you seal your ancestors to you. And that's how the family of God becomes united. And, and that's true. Joseph Smith was teaching that. Mm-hmm. Um, but but they're, what they're saying is that he was teaching that and not living. And so that's what that's what became Whitney Horning uh, wrote the book uh, Joseph Smith Revealed. I don't, I don't know that she's associated with the remnant. I haven't heard that she has been. She's, um, but her book is popular among the remnant. And uh, that's, that's the position she takes. What she says is uh, people like Sarah Ann Whitney uh, were, were sealed to Joseph Smith. And she, in the book, she says as wives. But that that was merely like a ceremonial term. And it's later 
Brigham Young adds that adds adds the part where by wives you mean that you live together, that you have marital relations together, that you have children together. That that's something that comes along later, and then and then that gets retroactively applied by the people to when Joseph Smith was alive to give it more legitimacy. And so, um, so that's kind of that narrative too. So that, so today, um, I think there's basically those two narratives. There's a uh, you're going to have um, you're going to have uh, the prices narrative where they talk about how um, Joseph wasn't doing. It's a complete fraud. Polygamy is a complete fraud. Complete falsification. There was no, there was nothing going on doing that. Um, uh, Ron Karen, who wrote the exoneration, I think it's, I'm gonna get the name right. The exoneration of Emma, Hiram, and Joseph. He kind of he goes along with the crisis too. He he takes and he elaborates on there a bit, a bit too. That's a popular book you'll hear um, quoted quite a bit. And then um, and then you have the other. So that's the one narrative. So that's that's complete fraud. The other one is that's very popular among the remnant. And uh, that's that's the partial fraud thing about how those ceilings and uh, and I believe uh, from one of my interactions the people how ceilings and polygamy got tied together. Is yeah. That so um, yeah, yeah. And so the, the most vocal group right now that's really come a lot now um, is uh, is another is another group that's that's kind of um, similar is it's uh, by Phil Davis is another individual that's come out recently, and uh, his is a much smaller group, but he's got some pretty media savvy people um that that work with them and and um and they're the ones that are very much um that that are i i think i'd say um leading the charge on on you know like in the utah front at least on this too um they 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 run the site hemlock knots you'll see references to that a lot and um yeah and so and and from what I can tell, at least, they kind of go along with that it was ceilings that was converted to polygamy. So those are those are your those are your major counter narratives that we have out right there right now. I think there's variations on those, but um, and um, it really depends on who you talk to, what all the little nuances are. Mm -hmm. But uh, but that that's base I that's basically it, uh, or at least as a general idea, that's it. So that's that's kind of the evolution of, of of that, the development of that. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with attorney Mark Tensmeyer. In our next conversation, we're going to talk about the secret practice of polygamy. If it was secret, what types of evidence would we expect to find? Since polygamy is something that was happening in um that was being denied openly while being practiced privately, um you know, you're, you're, you're contemporary, you're going to have basically a few kinds of evidence. You're going to have, um, I, I would say four kinds of evidence. And it's important to look at all of these. You're going to have privately held evidence that are private records by the people that are participating that are pro blue, that are pro, that are faithful. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please subscribe to patreon.com slash gospel tangents for just $5 a month. Patreon is spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash gospel tangents. If you'd like to watch the entire video, you can subscribe at YouTube, Patreon, or on my website at gospeltangents.com and click the yellow subscribe button for just $8 a month. PDF transcripts are just $10 a month, and you can get those on patreon.com slash gospeltangents or on my website. I'll send those to you as soon as I've finished completing it. If you'd like to get a paperback and PDF, just subscribe for $20 a month at either Patreon or on my website. Individual paperbacks are available at amazon.com. Just do a search for Gospel Tangents interview, and you can find all of our past interviews there. Share your Gospel Tangents pride by purchasing a t-shirt on our website at gospeltangents.com slash shop. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts at tinyurl.com slash gospeltangents. You can get our latest updates by friending me at Facebook, or you can also follow our page at facebook.com slash gospeltangents. Become an insider and you can see the newest videos. Follow us on Twitter at gospeltangents. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript, and over here we've got some of our great videos. Thanks again.